Hello, everybody. Let's get started on part two of OCHEM. So, so far we've covered our OCHEM fundamental toolkit, and that should give you the tools to solve a lot of OCHEM problems. And moving forward, we're going to be covering separations and spectroscopy in part two of OCHEM. So this video is going to include chromatography, and the next video is going to include other separation techniques and spectroscopy. Let's get started. So chromatography. So chromatography is the separation of a mixture of compounds. Separation of a mixture of compounds based on different physical properties. And how chromatography will separate things, it'll rely on differences between the molecules where interaction with a mobile or stationary phase, interaction with a mobile or stationary phase causes the substances to move at different rates. Interaction with a mobile or stationary phase will cause the substances to move at different rates. Any questions on our first definition? In chromatography, our mobile phase will be the solution mixture. And the stationary phase will actually differ a little bit. Uh, but it could be a column, a silica gel, things like that. And we'll be abbreviating moving forward mobile phase as MP, stationary phase as SP. So our first separation technique is going to be size exclusion chromatography. SBC. Size exclusion chromatography. In size exclusion chromatography, the stationary phase will be porous beads. The porous beads, which small molecules have to navigate. And so they will travel slower and large molecules, uh, large molecules will simply go around. Large molecules will move faster. So if we wanted to depict what's happening here, we have a column 
we have a collection flask. And if we, we're packing our column with beads, packing our column with beads, if we zoom in on what's happening here, Zoom in on what's happening. Actually, let's make these guys a little bigger. We have a small in blue. We have a large in green. Our small molecule is gonna be forced to travel through these beads. It's gonna come out slower. Whereas our large molecule is gonna find the easiest way through. It's gonna pass faster. So this is how size exclusion chromatography will work. Large molecules will move faster. Now this is in contrast with gel electrophoresis. So both um, agarose gel electrophoresis and polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, right? In gel electrophoresis, do large molecules move faster or slower? Yeah, in gel electrophoresis, large molecules will move slower. So how do we explain this discrepancy? Why is it different for gel electrophoresis compared to uh, uh, size exclusion chromatography? The question that always sort of annoyed me. <laughs> I couldn't really figure it out in uh, biochem. Yeah, in chromatography, the stationary phase traps the small molecules. Mm -hmm. So the, the main difference being that in size exclusion chromatography, there's multiple different paths molecules can take. They can go directly through the beads. So if you're small, you're gonna get trapped in the pores. You're gonna to have to navigate through the beads. If you're large, you can go around them. Whereas in gel electrophoresis, there's, there's no beads. There's just a solid gel. So you don't have options. You don't get to choose in gel electrophoresis how you go through the gel. You have to go through the gel matrix. And so large molecules can't go around anything. They have to go through the same matrix and because they're larger, it takes longer. So does that make sense for a difference between size exclusion chromatography and gel electrophoresis? All right, moving on to our next example, thin layer chromatography. We'll see. It's a thin layer chromatography. Our stationary phase will be a polar silica gel, which is often just a fancy name for glass. We know glass is very polar because if we've seen like a solution in like a glass beaker, for instance, we know that the meniscus points up so the solution of aqueous, uh, aqueous solution likes the glass a lot because we can see it like wants to stick to the glass because the meniscus points up. Now, if you had a hydrophobic solvent like benzene or hexane, we'd actually see the meniscus point down, meaning that the sol solution actually likes itself more than it likes the glass. So if you ever forget silica is polar, you can always think about that. Let's also just show I'll, I'll do it on my whiteboard. I don't have the screen share. Um, the silica structure. Is a matrix. And on the edge of the matrix. We have a whole bunch of OHs. So we can see why now. This would be like where our 
our solution is, we can see why silica gel is so polar. It's got lots of oxygens, and particularly on the edge, it has hydroxyl groups, which can hydrogen bond. In TLC, our mobile phase will be a less polar uh, solvent, such as hexane or diethyl ether. And so the separation principle for thin layer chromatography separates by polarity. If you are more polar, will you move farther along the gel or less far? Travel further. So do you like the stationary phase or the mobile phase more if you're polar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you're polar, you're gonna like the stationary phase more. So you're gonna travel less. The less polar you are in TLC, the more you're gonna like the mobile phase. And so you're going to travel further. Perfect, yeah. Um, we wouldn't necessarily say elutes, one thing. We wouldn't say like they elute necessarily because this whole thing's kind of just taking place on a gel, like a, like literally a picture of glass slide. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about how we measure um, uh, the separation degree, which is a little different from, uh, from like elution time or retention time, which is how we deal with uh, how fast or slow things move through other types of chromatography. So for example, let's say we had a mixture of ethanol, acetic acid, and ethyl acetate. So let's say we had a mixture of these three compounds. And the question is, how far did ethyl acetate move? Three centimeters, seven centimeters, oh, five centimeters five centimeters, seven centimeters, and D is like some like, cannot be determined without further spectroscopic data, AKA, I, I don't know, RF factor, yeah, exactly. So let's say that we had a, silica gel, and we call this the solvent front. And we would usually designate a point at which we would stop um, the, uh, the migration. Let's say that the difference between these is 10 centimeters. And let's say that we have two lanes. We have lane A, we have lane B. After time T passes, Let's say that the first lane has now separated 
into three bands. Our first lane is now separated into three bands and our second lane just has one band. So how far did ethyl acetate move? So we can start by sort of ranking our three compounds in terms of polarity. We have an alcohol, a carboxylic acid, and an ester. Who's gonna be the most polar here? Who will be our most polar? Alcohol, carboxylic acid, or ester? So of course we have two compounds that can hydrogen bond. Which compound can hydrogen bond better, an alcohol or carboxylic acid? The carboxylic acid will be able to hydrogen bond better because it has an additional dipole. So we have most polar, we have second most polar, and our ester does not have hydrogen bonding. Our ester will be the least polar. So definitely our carboxylic acid and our ester are gonna to correspond to the most extreme bands in our lane. And is our blue band going to be the ester or the carboxylic acid? Our ester, yeah. So because our ester is the least polar and because our plate is very polar, our ester clearly, our blue line, our blue band did not like the plate very much. It really was a fan of the solvent. And so we could say, that's our ester. We could say our carboxylic acid is in green. And we could say our alcohol was in the middle. Follow-up question. Uh, what was the purpose of lane B? What was the purpose of lane B in this experiment? Control, good. So if we start thinking about this experiment, it's presented to us in this OCHEM question. We could say that what type of reaction were the experimenters probably doing? Maybe we haven't gotten to reactions in our videos. We do have an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. And so we can combine an alcohol and a carboxylic acid to make an ester. And what do we call that reaction? The yeah, Fischer esterification. So what's going on here? We reacted these two compounds to get this compound. And that would make sense for the ester being the control because we probably are doing this TLC in order to determine if our reaction is completed. Has our reaction completed or are we still, uh, do we need to wait longer? We still have reactants left over, we still have our alcohol, we still have our carboxylic acid left over. So that would tell us that we need to run this, need to run longer because we still have some reactant present. Now the control lane, so if we're smart, we know what our two compounds were, we know what they're supposed to make. So we could probably just go into the OCHEM stock room and get some ethyl acetate, since we know that we're predicting that's to be the product. And so we're gonna to go to the stock room, we're gonna grab some ethyl acetate, we're gonna dab it onto our second lane as a control to determine if our reaction has gone to completion. 
And so if we got a result like this from lane A, lane A being the reaction mixture, we could say that our reaction has not gone to completion and therefore we need to run our reaction longer. And then we could also say out of our options here, uh, as far as how far did the ethyl acetate move, uh, it's probably just gonna be seven centimeters because it's like not quite to the 10 centimeter like full um, where the solvent went. But it looks like it's more likely going to be seven as opposed to five and three, which probably correspond five to our alcohol and three to our carboxylic acid. Any questions before we um, continue? And I erase some things here. So if we say that our ester moved seven centimeters, we can also use RF to measure. So what is this RF? RF is called the ratio to the front. And RF will be a ratio of the distance the spot traveled over the distance the solvent traveled. And so in this case, our spot for the ester was seven centimeters. And the distance our solvent traveled was 10 centimeters. So we'd get a ratio of 0 0.7 for our RF. And notably, RF has no units because it is a ratio of centimeters over centimeters. Any questions on TLC? All right, let's move on to column chromatography. So in column chromatography, standardly, the stationary phase will be silica beads. We established that silica is polar. Our mobile phase will be the solvent mixture and will be less polar. These two conditions are what are called normal phase. Normal phase is when the stationary phase is more polar and the mobile phase is less polar. So for column chromatography, our separation principle is also polarity. Very similar to TLC, in that TLC stationary phase is also more stationary. So if you were, a lot of questions when they talk about normal and reverse phase on the MCAT, a lot of questions will actually specify what they mean by normal phase and reverse phase. So I don't know that you need to specifically memorize what normal phase is and what reverse phase is. Um, when I used to work for TPR, they told us that the students should memorize that. But I have seen um, all the questions that I've seen that deal with normal phase versus reverse phase will actually uh, define what they mean by that. And we measure not by RF, but by elution time. What do we mean by elution time? So if we have a column. And some beakers or test tubes. And we have a bunch of beads, silica beads or polar. Oh, you've had it. Um... You've had it come up where they don't define normal and reverse phase. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, good to, good to memorize then. And one thing that doesn't, that I think gets overlooked a little bit when um, you're looking at textbooks on like column chromatography is like, how do the things actually go through the column? Like what forces them to actually go through the column? And when I ask my students this, a lot of them will use the most logical, rational um, principle of gravity. And they'll say, that, oh yeah, gravity is what causes the solution to move through columns. Um, in reality, what is actually the case, if you've done column chromatography, you probably know this, is you actually hook up your column to a pump and the pump actually pushes the solution through the column. And so that's how these things will actually go through the column. And then um, as they move through the column, they like the stationary phase more, they're going to hang out a little longer. So they'll have a higher elution time. So in the case of we have in normal phase, a more polar sol solute, they'll have a higher elution time. So then if you're ending up in uh, the first fraction, fraction A, you're probably the least polar. And then if we have B is sort of like filling up, B you're gonna be sort of in the middle and then C we haven't actually gotten to C yet. So C will have the highest elution time because we're moving these things from left to right. C will have the highest elution time and it will be the most polar once we get to it. What's the difference between elution time and retention time? Are they the same or opposites? It seems like elution time and retention time should be opposites because elution seems like the opposite of retention. But I think about the time, If you take a longer time to elute, that's because you're retained for a longer time. So you see these two terms come up a lot, elution time and retention time when it comes to passages. And so just know that they mean the same thing. If you take a longer time to elute to leave the column, you will also have a longer retention time because again you're retained in the column for longer that makes sense any questions that would be column chromatography now hplc HPLC will be known as high performance, or depending on who you ask, high pressure, liquid chromatography. High performance or high pressure liquid chromatography. By default, HPLC is reverse phase. By default, it's reverse phase. Meaning the stationary phase will be less polar beads and your mobile phase will be a more polar solvent. So what are some other differences between standard liquid chromatography and uh, high performance or high pressure HPLC? Um, in HPLC, we will also have a pump. We'll have an injector where we put our sample into. 
we will have a column that is like inside the machine and presumably has lots of surface area. We'll hook this up to a detector. The detector will be connected to a monitor. It'll spit out some results. It'll tell us, do we have a pure sample? It'll tell us a little bit about the composition. Monitor, the detector may use stuff like mass spectrometry um, or it may use absorbance. And so if you get like many bands or like many peaks, In this case, it looks like we had two peaks. So we have two molecules. And your HPLC will also have a way for collection. So HPLC, because it has a method of collection, it is, can be considered a macro scale technique in terms of macro scale techniques will allow for separation on a large scale of substances and then collection subsequently so that you can perform more experiments or more um, methods on your solutes that you've separated. Whereas micro scale like TLC, TLC is micro scale. So with TLC, you're not gonna go back to your glass slide and like collect your ethyl acetate um, you're really using TLC to determine if the reaction is completed. So HPLC and liquid chromatography, as well as size exclusion, are macro scale separation techniques where you can actually like do subsequent things on your solutes once you've obtained them. Whereas TLC um, wouldn't be a technique you would use for large scale separations. And so you're not going to be able to like do follow up experiments after you've done TLC. I hope that makes sense. Uh, the reason why I'm distinguishing between microscale and macroscale is because you could get a question where it's like, oh, two compounds have a difference in polarity. What technique would be the best for separating them? And you would maybe have something like um, melting point um, determination, and that wouldn't be a separation technique. You might have something like NMR, answer choice B, not a separation technique. And then maybe C and D, you have thin layer chromatography and HPLC. And so our question is about separating A and B. So you would prefer to do HPLC because you can separate them and then do subsequent things on them. Whereas with TLC, you wouldn't really be able to do anything else. So that's why I bring up the difference between macro and micro scale. All right, um, any questions on HPLC? So let's do ion exchange. ion exchange chromatography, our stationary phase will be charged groups covalently linked to beads. Our mobile phase will be our mixture and the separation principle will be by charge attraction. So for instance, let's say we had a column with positively charged beads. And we had a mixture of compounds where A is positive, 
B is neutral. And C is negative. And so in the column, like before we put anything into the column, there's also going to be counter ions balancing out the charge. So in the case of a positive column, we would have negative, negatively charged ions such as, um, gosh, I always annoy myself when I use C minus and chloride. Let me do for elimination of any confusion, let's do iodide. So we have I minus balancing out the charge initially. Then when we run our solution through the column, And let's say we have fraction A, fraction B. The fraction A is completed. Fraction B is filling up. Let's draw back our charge groups. Uh, which compound would most likely end up in fraction A? Would it be compound A, B, or C? Uh, would a positive column be considered? Ah, yes, great question. I used to get these things confused all the time. Yeah. Um, so because compound A had a positive charge, we could find a plus in our first fraction. Now B is not gonna particularly love this positive charge, but B is also going to elute. It's probably not gonna come out as fast as A, might be in the second fraction. And our iodide will also be displaced. So we could also find iodide in there because compound C is going to replace iodide and stay in a column. And so I used to get the definitions of uh, cation exchange chromatography and anion exchange chromatography flipped all the time. And so um, when you have a positive column, you're starting with negative ions to counterbalance the charge. You're replacing, you're exchanging the negative ion for a different negative ion. So this would be anion exchange because we've exchanged the I minus, the iodide. Oh, why did I write Cl minus? That's confusing. Uh, we've replaced the I minus, the iodide with compound C, which is negatively charged. So we've exchanged an anion for an anion. Okay. Any other questions before we wrap up our session today while we're still recording for YouTube? All right, everybody. Well, I will see everybody on YouTube in the next video, and I hope everybody has a fantastic week. Bye now. We'll continue. Oh, sorry. We'll <laughs> not bye. We'll continue with um, chromatography and separation techniques in our following video for next week. And uh, we will we'll do another example of ion exchange, just really ha hammer that down. That's not an expression. Nail that down, um, hammer that in. And then we will continue with other separation techniques including affinity chromatography, um, gas liquid chromatography, distillations, extractions, resolution of enantiomers, and then we'll continue on to spectroscopy. And that's what's coming up on the horizon. So I hope everybody has a great week and I will see you in the next video.